Well, Dr. Mayo, it is amazing to have you here. For those who don't know you, you actually were one of my professors in college, Mm -hmm. and now you're an international teacher. You were telling me about your itinerary for a year of all the seminaries and churches and places that you're teaching at, and it was making you want to go with you. So (laughs) maybe you have a tag along, but thanks for being here in Minneapolis and having a conversation on Talking Church today about a topic that you're familiar with. Okay. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. They probably clicked on this. They saw the title, Dealing with Revelation, and it's a book that is often talked about in the in the sense of we talk about revelation, but that's about as far as we get. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a book. Yeah. And yeah. the class that I was in with you was revelation, and you only taught that a couple times, so yeah. I feel privileged. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, central, um, yeah. But you're an author of a book, and you did that through Princeton Seminary, and you did that for your dis- dissertation, and maybe talk about why you were interested in Revelation, and then we can talk about maybe some applications and ways to understand it better, ways for pastors to actually dive in and not just sit back and yeah. th- not touch it. Okay. Well, yeah, I uh, actually got interested in eschatology when I was in college. And I did I actually did my senior paper on the um, pre-tribulation rapture versus the post-tribulation rapture. That was my senior paper. So, I mean, that wasn't the title, but I don't. I actually don't remember the title anymore. But it was something along that lines. And then um, I just, you know, that interest kind of just continued. And when I went into my doctoral work at Fuller Seminary, um, I they asked me. I I, I first actually applied for a biblical the a biblical studies um, PhD which they canceled right before I got, <laughs> I got to the seminary. So they Why? Asked, um, I think probably, I'm not really sure, maybe not enough enrollment. It might have been that. I don't know. They just ended up uh, having uh, Old Testament, New Testament. So you had to kind of choose between one of them. So I picked the New Testament, and then they asked me, well, what did I want to do? Because normally in a PhD program, you you know study with someone, particularly someone who's uh, known in the field. And so I said, I want to study Revelation, and uh, I got assigned to David Scholler. And um, so worked on that, you know, and published my dissertation uh, in 2006 in Revelation. And that's what ended up turning into your book. Yeah. Um, actually, I was interested in two things. I was interested in Jewish-Christian relations uh, in the early church, and I was interested in Revelation. So the the dissertation, which became a book, ended up, being a, um, a look at how John portrayed the church in Judaism in the apocalypse. Yeah, that I, I read it as required reading for <laughs> the, the class. <Yeah. clears throat> we talked about this, and, and we don't have time to go through a, a semester-long class and mm-hmm. things that we learned. Um, but yeah. when, when you see pastors, I, I hear it all the time. Actually, this was one of the most requested topics I had the last end of last year, I said, hey, what are topics you want to talk about? And a lot of people said revelation, revelation, Mm -hmm. end times or eschatology. And Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people who maybe they went to a Bible school or maybe they went to seminary, but even this topic is, it's not typically the one that is the main focus, or at least what I saw. Mm -hmm. It's You Mm -hmm. obviously have the gospels and you have Mm -hmm. the letters of Paul and all sorts of things that you can study. But typically this one is, is put on the back burner, but then you see sometimes these prophets and these people that will say, look at this, the blood moon and the, and this, yeah, yeah. and and there's yeah, all sorts of things. True. My grandpa, he was a big fan of all that. And he would have us watch yeah. these videos and say, yeah. look at it's coming. And as pastors, I think people want to be equipped for this, or even just leaders in the church. They say, I want to understand revelation better. And there's, there's maybe some who I don't want to necessarily call them crazy, but they're, they're, they're very <laughs> emphatic. Yeah. about some of the things that yeah. it says yeah. in the literal sense. But then on the other side, there's people who just push it aside and don't even address it. Yes. I, I find many yeah. pastors find themselves in the middle. They're wanting to be not crazy, but also they're wanting to address this, and they don't know where to get started. So you've been kind of helping pastors. What would you guide them and say as they're maybe yeah. on that journey? Yeah, I think that's one of the greatest tragedies uh, for the book of Revelation is that few people want to deal with it. Uh, I think the average believer just... You know, I think there are there are people. I had a, I actually, um, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but I actually preached a sermon on New Year's Eve on the Book of Revelation. Well, it wasn't exactly on the Book of Revelation, but my points came from the Book of Revelation. And that's still more than most. <laughs> yeah, that's more than most, right? And I had someone tell me, 
after the ser- after the first service that they were they it, you know because it was December they were in Revelation in their Bible reading plan. Sure. They didn't really know what they were reading, but they were reading because they were supposed to, you know, it was part of the plan. And and because of my message, she said, you know, it gave me a new perspective on how I should view Revelation, you know, how I should come to understand it. And um I, I had another experience. Uh, I was teaching a Sunday school class at a local church. This was a few years ago. I had a woman sitting in the front row of the class, 92 years old. She told me it was the first time that she had ever been in a Sunday school class that taught the book of Revelation. Wow. And even at North Central, like you, you know, you said earlier about Bible colleges having, you know, Pauline theology or, you know, the Gospels, those kinds of things. There was no class on the book of Revelation. There was a class on apocalyptic literature in general, which was much broader than the book itself. And, um, you know, I went to the director of the program at the time. I said, hey, my dissertation is in the book of Revelation. You know, why, why aren't we teaching that? And so, you know, he let me teach it, and I started teaching it, as you know. So, yeah, I, th- I think one of the things, you know, one of the things I would want to see and try to do when I teach the book of Revelation is... Uh, cause people to not be afraid of it. Like for my students, I wanted them to say, hey, this is this is just a regular book in the New Testament. <clears throat> and it's um, nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, it's a little challenging to interpret. It's not Paul, right? It's not, not right. real straightforward. And that's the nature of apocalyptic literature. And I, I think that's the first thing people have to recognize, which is a little difficult to do if you're not trained. But that revelation is a genre of literature that's pretty old, that we don't really have anymore. I kind of liken it sometimes to the Chronicles of Narnia. Hmm. You know, that's kind of maybe the most you know close modern thing we right. have to the book of Revelation, where you have a little bit of a fantastic story. You know, you have a lion, Aslan, who everybody knows he's Christ, but nobody really says it in the story exactly. You know, and that's kind of the way apocalyptic literature is. It never says anything straight up. Mm. It talks in images. It's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. You know, it wants to, I mean, you, you think about it, the name of Jesus, I think, appears in the first verse, maybe at the end of the book. But otherwise, whenever Jesus is present in the book of Revelation, his name, he is always shown in imagery that is unmistakable, you know, the rider on the white horse whose name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords tattooed on his thigh. Uh, He has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and he's got crowns, all kinds of crowns on his head. You know, those are things that we recognize that's got to be Jesus, you know, Mm -hmm. we we know that, and... um, same thing, you know, in, in a chapter four with uh, the lamb, the lion who becomes a lamb that is slain but is standing. I mean, all of those things communicate pretty clearly uh, what that image is, you know. Of course, there are other images that aren't communicated so clearly. And actually, Revelation interprets, interprets some of it, the images, but we don't understand the interpretation. So that's the other problem with it. But if you can approach Revelation, I think, with what we call a genre hermeneutic, that is a, an, an interpretation based on the type of book it is, and come to understand that it's a book full of imagery mm-hmm. and that you have, to, you have to realize that it's not intended to be literal, which is the biggest problem for interpreting the book of Revelation. I think that's something for, for those who maybe struggle in general with any bit of hermeneutic, but those who are maybe newer, and, and I'm... 27, you know, I like, I, I have so much more. I, I started um, my master's and I remember talking to my dad and saying, I know nothing. Like I, I've gone to a new realm to where I, I feel like I don't know anything again. And I feel like there's pastors that find themselves there when they start studying Revelation or any of the apocalyptic yeah. literature, mm-hmm. they feel like just so ill-equipped. When you look at starting to put handles on it. Not to say, I mean, I did my final paper in your class on the throne room vision. And I oh, yeah. I, I think it was favorite. five verses that I did a whole paper on, you know, so mm-hmm. you can you can talk about it for a long time. Mm-hmm. But we could do that and go, you know, chapter by chapter sure, and try yeah. to interpret these <clears throat> different things. But that's not obviously what we can do in this short amount of time. But as you look at what are some of those resources or what are the, some of those ways or or frameworks 
to where people can start to understand or or at least have the intimidation factor go down because maybe you, you say, I have a dissertation on this. I understand it. I remember in the class we talked about, we read through parts of Ezekiel and Daniel and even yeah. other, other extra biblical works to understand that criteria. But right. maybe if there's advice for people that they'd say, okay, you've got me convinced that I need to do this, but now what, what are my next steps? Yeah. You know, I, I, I think, you know, Gordon Fee, I heard Gordon Fee say one time that whenever we be read the book of Revelation, our mind goes out the window. <laughs> and um, I think if you can, I think most pastors um, understand how to interpret and study, say, 1 Corinthians or Matthew or, or Mark. They know how to approach that. It's, it's, a, it's either story or it's didactic material that they can get a handle on. But really, Revelation's the same thing. You, you have to approach it the same way. Obviously, it's not a gospel. It is in a certain sense an epistle. It was sent to churches. But you have to kind of approach it as um, in its context. You know, the first thing we always do is try to figure out the context of any book or any, any passage of Scripture. So, you know, <clears throat> the context is really set up in the first uh, three chapters of the book. And um, it says in chapter 1 that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ given to his servant John through his angel. And so we're already told there that it's a revelation that comes from Jesus. And there are those, you know, who debate when you say revelation of Jesus, or is it the revelation that belongs to Jesus, or is it the revelation of the person of Jesus? Well, you might say it's both. I mean, you know, I'm, right. I'm okay with both. But I think Primarily, it's a revelation that comes from Jesus. And I think the reason it comes from Jesus is because Jesus is talking to his church. I mean, that's the first thing you get in the very first chapter is, is again, it's, it's imagery of, of Jesus. The, the very first vision is a vision of Jesus. Again, he's not named in the vision, but the description of him is a very heavenly one, you know, and he's standing in the midst of the candlesticks. And we're told what, who this, what the candlesticks are. We're told they're the churches. And he's, stand, and he's got seven stars in his right hand, and we're told what the seven stars are. So it's not a real mystery there, but it, it's starting us out on that, that mode of imagery that's supposed to communicate. And, I, you know, one of the things I said when I was preaching on New Year's Eve is that Revelation is a book of hope. It's primarily designed to be a book of hope. I mean, I've seen different scholars who say the, you know, what the primary theme of Revelation is. My PhD mentor used to say it, it's uh, perseverance of the saints was the mm. central. And there's some truth to that, but it's primarily a book of hope. Because if you look at the messages of the churches in, the first, in chapters 2 and 3, these are churches who are struggling either with Conflict within, you know, they've got um, false doctrine, they've got other issues going within inside the church, or they're being persecuted from the outside. And they're under duress, and the message to them is, I'm here, I'm in your midst. And if you'll just hang in there, if you'll overcome, that's the, the key word to overcome, then I'll give you this. You know, and they get, they get various rewards. And those those messages are sandwiched between a vision of the Christ who says, I'm the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Um, I'm the one who was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the keys to death in Hades. And so he says that before he speaks to the churches, and then after he speaks to the churches in chapter 4, he invites John up to heaven. It's the same voice. Again, it doesn't say, oh, Jesus invited me up to heaven. It's the voice I heard before like a trumpet. Well, that's the voice in chapter 1, right? right? So it's, it's all this imagery that we're supposed to follow. And when John gets up there, this is probably my favorite verse in all of Revelation. When he gets up there, I think it's verse 4, chapter 4. He says, at once I was in the Spirit, and there was a door standing open in heaven, and I saw a throne with someone sitting on it. And, and that's just an amazing text right there. But that's the message to the church. God's still on the throne, mm. you know. Those are the kinds of things I think you can preach. 
You can preach those kinds of things because who who doesn't who doesn't go through difficulties now? Right. Yeah, you know, the churches do, but but so do individuals go through difficulties. What's the message? Well, I, I hold the key to death and Hades. I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And God's on the throne. And lo and behold, as, as you well know, in chapter five, we find out that Jesus is on the throne too, mm-hmm. but he's again portrayed as a lion and then a lamb. So understanding that that revelation is a, a book of images um, that it has to be uh, those images are are communicating something beyond what they are mm-hmm. you know one of the things I think one of the greatest disservices that has been done to the book of Revelation has occurred in probably the last 150 to 200 years and that's um, all the hype that has surrounded it you know there are people who over the years who think that you can lay, you know, your Bible down on one side and the local newspaper or the national newspaper down on the other side and interpret Revelation or interpret the paper based on Revelation. And I I just think that's wrongheaded thinking. It isn't that the things that are going on in this world don't relate to Revelation. They do because Revelation is about... um, a world system that's gone wrong without God. You know, that's Babylon. It's uh, it's about greed. It's about lust. It's about people refusing to listen to God. It's about people refusing to repent. It's about God giving them the re- results of their sin, the, the reward or the punishment of that sin. And actually, which is the love of God, yeah, I said one time in, in one of my classes to my students that the wrath of God is actually the love of God, and they, it shocked them. They were like, what do you mean by that? Well, it's a, you know, what is it uh, the writer of Hebrews says? He quotes the Proverbs when he says, um, God disciplines those he loves and chastises those he considers to be children. And um, his goal, of course, is to get people to repent, and sometimes allowing the consequences of the sin results in the repentance. Sometimes it doesn't. And so in the book of Revelation, you know, you get the first seals, you get the first seven seals, and then you get the trumpets. And at the end of chapter 9, it says, but they, they refused to repent, and they cursed God. Hmm. You know, so it, it's kind of like God gives this opportunity, but, but it doesn't work. For everybody, right. unfortunately, I think one of the the things I see and one of the things I experienced myself in Revelation, a lot of times it's brought up as well. This is kind of the only book that it's to be continued, right? Yeah. In that we see this story and this narrative and this history and even the life of Jesus. We know that he's alive today, but there was this history on earth of the Gospels that we get to read and it's mm-hmm. time, and you get to Revelation and it's kind of like. At the end of a movie that's like, all right, it's up for interpretation. And, of course, we have a lot of eschatological views, and we have people that are looking for the Antichrist and saying, aha, it's her or it's him or it's this political figure or whatever it is, which in some ways I— I almost posted this the other day on social media, but I didn't think it would people would get what I was trying to say. But I was trying to say, how prideful and arrogant are we that we kind of put our time period and our life and yes, our that's good. like our moment mm-hmm. as the moment, and it's kind of what you're referencing with the newspaper mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. to where I'm one of, I don't know, I mean, it depends on your argument of how many people, 100 billion people to live on this earth or mm-hmm. 50 billion or however many you think have lived in the history, who's going to live, I don't know, maybe 80 years on this earth. And it's like we because it's our two eyes that we're looking out from, we become the center of the universe. And it just seems to be in the same way that we saw, um, was it Copernicus, that, you know, the the heliocentric versus the geocentric view Mm -hmm. to where we've made ourselves the center of the story. And in some ways we are our own center of our own story because it's the only story we, again, we view from this perspective. But I think because of that, that's where our eschatology or our, our view of who's the Antichrist or whatever it is, we make it feel like, well, that has to be happening today. And what I'm constantly reminded by as I read commentaries from the first century, they thought it was that that time as well. When they said he was come mm-hmm. back soon, they were yeah. they think it's pretty soon. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, as you think about that and even that, that analogy you brought up, how do we avoid that thinking of feeling like, 
2024 is the year of when the <laughs> rain is starting or when yeah. or when the, yeah. or, or that <clears throat> political figure has got to be the antichrist or yeah. it's ai or it's this you know yeah yeah ai is the beast huh? yeah. yeah right um, you heard it here first yeah <laughs> yeah scratch that um yeah a great point and a great question um that's what you know. What you just described is what what's called the futuristic interpretation of Revelation, and it tends to be a literal one. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a kid that um, you know the church I was in used to show on when on Wednesday night. You know we had the Wednesday night services, and and they would show Thief in the Night. And it was all about. I mean, it scared you to death, oh, you yeah. know, because you just didn't want to be left behind, right? And then there was uh, the Hal Lindsey books, um, uh, great, late Great Planet Earth. Um, and there's, I think, A New World Coming is another one he wrote, which is a very literal interpretation. I think at one point, you know, he said the, the scorpions with the stinging tails, uh, I th- which are, I think, are in, cham- I can't remember, chapter 9 maybe, um, are, are um, helicopters with Hellfire missiles. You know, and so the, that's that literal interpretation of this has to be a one-to-one correspondence. The problem with that, so what he would say, you know, and forgive me if I'm wrong. I think he's still, I think he's 92 years old and still alive. So forgive me if uh, this gets back to him. <laughs> but this is my understanding. But the the problem with that, of course, is it it fixes Revelation at a certain time and place, and it also, um, like you said, it it makes us the center of of everything which I think is sometimes the arrogance of the West. Right. Um, and Well, we, after all, in Revelation, are the, the power in the West that falls, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, too, you know, you know, what he would say would have said, at least, my, again, my understanding of what he would have said is that John didn't understand what he was describing because he'd never seen a helicopter before, so he described it as best he could. I just, I just think that's a wrong direction to go in with Revelation. You know, when I was young, again, you know, everybody, everybody in those, you know, literal uh, camps would say that the European Economic Union was uh, the Ten Kings. Hmm. At that time, I think there were probably like seven or eight countries in the European Economic Union. And as soon as it hit ten, and then there was a computer uh, called the Beast and supposedly in Brussels, um, now there are 27 countries in the European Economic Union, and so that's kind of gone out of the window. And there were, you know, there were other similar kinds of interpretation. And I, I just think that that's, um, I, I think the anchor you have to do with Revelation, which is what most scholars would say, is you have to look at it in its historical context because it was written to seven real churches in the first century A.D., and you have to look at the context of what they're facing. Um, the same thing we do, you know, with, say, First Corinthians and Paul. Right. If we wanted to, we'd go and we'd study Corinth and find out what life was like in Corinth, and why is he talking about eating food sacrificed to idols? Well, there were lots of temples, and people would go have meals there, you know, in front of the idol. And, um, and then you come to understand it. Well, you have to do the same thing with, you know, Pergamum, Smyrna, Thyatira, you know, Laodicea and, and Ephesus and, and, and Philadelphia. You have to do that with all those churches. Figure out what their context is, what they're going through, and how this message would have been a relief to them or a help to them. And one of the things about Revelation, if you study it closely, is it's, it's a message of hope, but it's not a message of an easy life. Yeah, I think probably the pinnacle of the book comes around Revelation 12 and 13 with the revelation of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, what we call the unholy trinity. It's the counterpart to the, you know, the trinity we see in Revelation 4 and 5. And um, in Revelation 13, when the dragon is standing on the shore of the sea and the beast rises up out of the sea and the false prophet comes from the earth, and you, you hear him say, you know, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. Those destined for the sword will go to the sword, you know. So it's, it's not a promise that things are going to get easy or easier. In fact, they get 
worse before they get better. Mm -hmm. I mean, Revelation 20 through 22 is really nice, but before that, it's kind of messy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think the I think the point of Revelation is to is one, one to tell the churches that God's still on the throne and that He's in control. Jesus has uh, paid the price. He's purchased for God a people for Himself, and He's going to get those people. In fact, He seals them in Revelation chapter seven, and all through the book, they're protected. They're they're not protected from tribulation or difficulty, but they're protected spiritually because they belong to God. And um, that there is a battle, a cosmic battle between Satan and God, mm -hmm. and the pawn in that battle are the people of God. So when Satan is thrown out of heaven in Revelation 12, he, he's on the earth and the message is, woe to the earth, because, you know, here he comes, you know. And he immediately chases the woman uh, in the, into the desert who represents the church. And then he does, he does war th on the church through his earthly counterparts, which are governments. Uh, in the case of Revelation, it's Rome. But could we extrapolate that out to today? I mean, could we, could we see another government or another commercial system that's exploiting people and persecuting God's people? Yeah. There's a lot of persecution going on in the world. And I've, I've been real cognizant of that as I've traveled more and more teaching to different countries. You know, one of the things I've, I've been asked to do uh, in May is to go to Vietnam and teach the Book of Revelation. And, and I've, I'm thinking to myself, wow, how do I, you know, Vietnam is a very different place from the United States. Mm -hmm. And they've been through a lot, a lot of, tough stuff and they and they have a government that isn't quite as uh, free as as ours you know a society quite as free as ours how would they see the book of revelation would they see themselves living it right now that's my question right and so when i go there to teach it and i'm coming from a very free society and a wealthy society and i i stand up there in front of them to to tell them what the book of revelation says it really humbles me because mm -hmm. I think, oh, wow, I have no idea what these people have been through mm -hmm. and how they might see these images for themselves. And so I think remembering, like you, you just pointed out, remembering that we're not the center of the universe. Right. And um, there are ways of some people are living the book of Revelation right now in other parts of the world. Well, isn't that so true, though, with just as we read Scripture as a whole? And I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the West. But I also think that some people are, some people feel like if you're a big fan, you can't be critical of it, you know, or vice versa. If you're critical of it, you can't be a fan. And when I, when I say a fan, I mean more just like the prosperity I've experienced in my life. Sure. Like, yeah. like obviously it's, it's not things that I'll carry with me later in, in eternity, but it still is like, I've traveled the world. I've been to a lot of countries and mm -hmm. I see, wow, this, we live in a, a land of prosperity and, yep. and especially from a wealth standpoint and sure. a, um, even basic needs, hygiene, things like that. But it makes you read scripture differently, you know? It does, yeah. And when, I, I think for a lot of Americans or even just those who are in a very high economic place, Revelation, you're almost like, all right, when do we get to the good stuff? You know, like, when yeah, do we get to Armageddon? Yeah. And when is the end of <clears throat> Like, I'm ready to fight. You know, it's almost this movie, right? Like, it's yeah, the movie yeah, Armageddon, yeah, yeah. or it's like mm -hmm. these these themes. And I think, to your point, there are other people right now who are saying, I don't know what you guys are talking about, because I need the hope side of this book. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. living, I like, yeah. I'm the saint that needs the encouragement, you yeah. know? And, mm -hmm. and that's where, even as I process this and what you're talking about, it's like, can it be true that that government is the same as what it was talking about as Rome was? Yeah. Be, like, mm -hmm. it's talking about persecution. And, and do you think that maybe, and again, I don't know how strong you are in this interpretation, but like, do you think maybe it's, it's a, a theme that it's trying to communicate rather than a specific time period that John's talking about? Because again, you go throughout history and say, all right, look at this person, look at this country. Even today, you go country by country. People in Ukraine are going, I don't know. 
this seems a looks little like Armageddon. Yeah, it looks like <laughs> Armageddon. But then yeah. you have just next door people swimming in the Black Sea in Turkey, and they're going, I don't know, this don't seem yeah. like Armageddon to me. Well, or Israel and Gaza. Well, know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so many people brought it up, and we talked about it. And you know, we had a friend come on who's kind of talked about the pre-millennial dispensationalist view. You know, mm-hmm. modern Israel is still important. And then there's other people that would say, well, no, that's totally not it at all. And I mean, I find, I, I try to carry eschatology pretty open-handed pretty lightly, yeah. because it's mm-hmm. like, it still is open. We don't know. It's very hard. And I think, again, this is my interpretation. Please correct me because uh, that's why you're here. But my thought is, it's almost like God has been speaking to me about this. It. like, you're almost after the wrong thing. Like you're after yeah. finding the eschat- eschatological answer when the answer's been there all along in Jesus. The book is about Jesus. Yes. And so I don't know if you can unpack maybe some warnings for us as we grab a hold of this eschatology or we grab a hold of some of our views that, some, I mean, I guess somebody's going to be right, <laughs> but <laughs> but they may be right all the way, you know, in their, in their anger or in their boastfulness. It, yeah, uh, Logan, the way I look at it, too, I look at the first coming of Jesus, and his, his own people didn't expect it the way it happened. It was just totally under the radar, and um, they thought they had it figured out. They were looking for a Messiah. I mean, I'm looking for a Messiah. You, too. You know, we're looking for him to come back, and it's just, it was just totally different from what they expected. But he fulfilled every prophecy that they read all the time in their synagogues. And I think it's going to be the same way. I don't know if you've found this. I, I have. I've lived a little bit longer than you <laughs> than you have. Um, uh, actually, this year is my 50th anniversary of serving God. Mm. And um, I've just found over my life the things that God has said to me, and I interpret the, them in the moment the way I thought they were meant. And as they played themselves out in my life, they ended up being either so much bigger than I thought or way different than I thought. The way he fulfilled them maybe wasn't the way I thought they were going to get fulfilled, but it was so much better. I was okay with it, you know. So I just think prophecy is like that. I think prophecy is about it's it's God sending a message, but God is um, he's he's kind of mysterious too. You know, he doesn't tell us everything. He doesn't feel obligated to tell us everything. He tells us what we need to know. We live on a need to know basis. Mm-hmm. And um, I think with the Book of Revelation, a lot of times people think if I could just figure out the key to unlock it. Uh, you know, out of it would pop all the answers for the world I'm living in today. It actually has the answers for the world we're living in today. There's a lot of good stuff there about um, what humanity is doing to its world and destroying it. You know, one of the things that happens in Revelation is the ten kings that actually give their power and authority to to the woman on the beast who's Rome, is Bab- called Babylon, is they hate her too. And they, they end up destroying her. I mean, so we end up, you know, humanity kind of ends up imploding in the book of Revelation. And it's because of the choices that we make. Well, you can see that happening mm-hmm. now. Um, and so I, I think um, people, people think that, that somehow, you know, there's a key to unlocking Revelation to interpret the world that we live in. And um, I think they're looking for more than it's really there. Mm-hmm. I remember one time I was invited to a church here locally to preach on the book of Revelation, and I got up, and the first thing I said is, I'm, I'm not here to give you all the answers. And two people got up and walked out. <laughs> Darn it, I was hoping yeah, to get it. Because they think, probably people watching the podcast today think I'm going to somehow give them some kind of, you know, um, picture of Revelation or some key to Revelation that's going to make all the difference, and I, I don't have it don't have that. But I, what I can say is it's the Word of God. Mm-hmm. It's in the New Testament. It needs to be treated respectfully like the rest of the books of the New Testament, interpreted in its context. It's got a message for the church. Um, we just need to listen to what Revelation says. You know, part of what uh, of, of what my training has been, and, and I think is, is just a good principle in general, is when you come to the Scriptures, you come 
trying to set aside your own biases. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of us can do that completely. Right. But try to come to Revelation with, and just let it speak for itself and try to think of it as to what, what, what would the early believers have thought when they read this or when they heard this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I remember my, my dad went on a global team to, to we call it like global experience, but uh, to Turkey to do this the tour mm -hmm. of the seven churches of of I Revelation. did that too, yeah. and I just remember him coming back. Like, he couldn't even articulate. He was like, "Oh my goodness, I, I had this wrong, and I I was thinking about this, and yeah. I, this makes so much more sense." And and yeah. I encourage people to to do that research. I haven't gone on that trip, and I want to, um, but I I I do think there are many things that. I think we miss them because we're looking for that silver bullet of trying to understand, mm -hmm. like, what's the silver bullet, the one key word, the passphrase that gets me to understand yeah. apocalyptic yeah. literature exactly. and interpreting it 2,000 years later, mm -hmm. and I want to be the guy that mm -hmm. has that. And I think we often carry it with, with that level. Like, it's not an arrogance, but it's more of just like, I want to be that. I want to figure it out. And often that's kind of the same thing that the Pharisees kind of found themselves in when Jesus was there. It's like, we're, we got the way to heaven. We got the path. And Jesus mm -hmm. is like, yeah, well, mm -hmm. don't you do this on the Sabbath? And like, well, uh, maybe, you know, yeah. and he yeah. kind of called them to a higher level. One of the things you mentioned was need to know basis. We're mm -hmm. on that need to know basis. Something mm -hmm. I've struggled to articulate, maybe it's just because I'm a young pastor, but the, the, the idea of, you know, not even Jesus knows the end, right? There's this, it's kind of been, I, I struggle to articulate it. I feel like I kind of understand that, but maybe if if, if I put you on the spot to take a stab at this uh -oh. thought <laughs> to say I, I've I've heard that I've heard it preached on, I've heard it talked about this idea, and sometimes I hear it, and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. But other times I'm like, I don't know. That that when he says, you know, the father, no one knows the day or day or hour, and now it's and it's brought up even the son, you know, like Jesus is standing there waiting. Have we misinterpreted that? Is that I don't know if you can add any context that you bring or if you'd say, Logan, I'm not taking a stab at that because I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's in the Gospel of Mark. Um, yeah, it's, um, there's, you know, there's a, uh, that's a difficult one, you know. Um, the, I guess the question is, did Jesus, was Jesus talking about his um, incarnate state? Right. And had he limited his own, uh, knowledge at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he's unaware now. Yeah. Um, that's that. That's that mystery of the incarnation where where he emptied himself. Right. He chose. Mm -hmm. He chose to limit himself. Yeah, because um, like God couldn't be killed. Right. You know, it's like. Right. <laughs> and so he allowed himself to be killed. Yeah. Yeah. And how was Jesus on the cross and God still on the throne? And right. All of that mystery. Yeah. The incarnation. The three in one, um, yeah. I I think in that situation, it's it's probably his own, uh, perhaps self limiting, right? Uh, knowledge of the situation, and perhaps a, a sense of emphasizing that this this event is going to be a mystery. It's not going to be something that, you right? Know, he says, you know, that it's going to be unexpected at a moment. You don't expect the Son of Man will come. Yeah, and. Um, so that's probably what's going on there, I would guess, mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, and, and that, that seems to be the thing that makes sense. But then there's other people who say, well, no, it's the, God's the planner, God, Jesus is not. And well, the, then you rip the Trinity apart. Right. I think you better be careful with that. Right, you right. Know? Yeah. Well, the, rather than providing you with all of the other hard questions that I have about <laughs> the book, I think um, yeah. I, I'd, I'd love to close with, Maybe your encouragement to those who, even after hearing this, I, I mean, even myself, I'm like, you, I've been through your class, so I, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot more. But for those who are listening the first time, I think realizing, you know what, I can do this. I can mm -hmm. talk about this. I can preach on mm -hmm. this. But maybe a final encouragement to people and any other nuggets you want to provide before we end to say, this is a book you're passionate about. It's a book you've put a lot of work into. Mm -hmm. You continue to preach on this and share. But giving it to people that says, hey, you can lead this in a small group. You can do this on the stage. Mm -hmm. And maybe if there's a another theme or another place, or you mentioned some of your favorite spots already that maybe yeah. we could close with that could, I don't know, provide 
provide just an, a, a lift to people that says, all right, I can do this, or a question that you say. I was going to end with what's the hardest thing to interpret in Revelation, but maybe we'll save that for round two. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, like I said, you have to let um, Revelation speak on its own terms. Some of it is more challenging than other parts of it, but there are messages in it of encouragement, of hope uh, to the church. Um, I used to, at, at North Central, at Christmas time, uh, I would read Revelation 12 to the students as the Christmas story mm. because it is, right. you know, it's, you know, a woman who's pregnant who gives birth to a child who, who will rule the nations with an iron rod, right? The, again, it's imagery. It's, they don't say it's Jesus, but they make it clear it's the Messiah. Yeah, it's funny. We didn't read that at our Christmas Eve services. <laughs> <laughs> no, most, most churches don't. And they, um, you know, he's caught up to heaven and the dragon tries to destroy him. And, you know, you have all of that uh, imagery that's um, there. There's some beautiful passages. Revelation 12 is, is one of them. But there's also, I think, um, usually right around the sixth or seventh, usually the seventh uh, trumpet, uh, the seventh bowl. Um, and um, it's, it's around the sixth, toward the end of the sixth seal. Um, because the seventh seal is just 30 minutes of silence in heaven. So usually the seventh seal, the seventh bowl, and the seventh trumpet are victory. So there's this, and, and you usually have some kind of interlude between six and seven, and then seven comes. And, there, and you'll get these, uh, these hymns of how the, you know, the kingdom has come now. Um, and um, it, it's, they're very beautiful. There's actually a sub-theme in Revelation of worship. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of song, songs in there, yeah. worship songs in yeah. there, which are easy to preach from. You know, uh, Revelation 5, where Jesus, you know, is re the Lamb is revealed and he takes the scroll and they sing a song to him, you know. And part of that song is that he has purchased for God a people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue to be a kingdom and priest for our God that they might reign on the earth. And wow, that's, that's just so powerful. That's powerful stuff. And it comes back again at the end of the book in, in chapter 21. And um, you have this, um, that, that actually was the passage God called me into international ministry with, which is another reason Revelation is so uh, fun to me. Revelation 5, 9, and 10 are, are those verses. And, um, you know, on... on um, like I said, on New Year's Eve, I preached a message and I, you know, I did three keys to, to a successful 2024. And I told him, I said, well, it's really three keys to, su to successful living. And uh, one of them was, you know, God's still on the throne, the passage I mm -hmm. shared from Revelation 4. The other one was Revelation 14. Uh, it's the first four verses. It's the description of the 144,000. And there's a statement in there that says they followed the lamb wherever he goes. Mm. And I, I, I said, that's discipleship. I mean, you can take a phrase like that and preach a message off of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They, because they just go wherever the Lamb says to go. And if you unpack those verses, the description, the description of those of the 144,000 sounds a, a little bit weird. They're all men um, because they're all virgins. Um, well, what is, you know, what is that? What is that? Well... It's again, it's not straight. It's not that there are 144,000 guys who've never been with a woman. That's not the point. The point is, is that they're pure. The soldiers didn't go into battle. When they went into battle, they didn't um, mingle with women. Remember David, when he went into mm -hmm. the, you know, into the, uh, the tent of meeting to get bread, you know, on his, and he said, no, my men have not ever been, haven't been with any women. They, they don't do that when they go into battle. So this, the idea is that, is that these 144,000 are soldiers. They're militants. That's why they're numbered in Revelation chapter 7. They're the army of God. Well, who are they? You and me is the church. 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000, right? It's the number 12 is the number of the people of God. And so it's the, the people of God innumerable. And so you have this group of people who are completely dedicated to God and will do anything They'll just go with the lamb wherever he goes. And, and you can preach a great message off of, of obedience and discipleship 
off of that and how, you know, you, I, and then I went to the Gospels with that and said, you know, this is what the disciples did. Mm-hmm. They followed Jesus wherever he went. And, um, and then, the, you know, the last thing I got was from Revelation uh, 21 where, you know, the, the uh, tabernacle of God is with humanity, that when New Jerusalem comes down and talked about how God, you know, is with us. He, this is his goal. This is the end goal, is God wants to be right smack in the midst of his people. So how did he, he started out with a tabernacle, a tent in the middle of the camp of Israel. Then he went to Jesus, who came down in the form of God and tabernacled among us. And then now we are the tent of God. We're the tabernacle of God. We have the Holy Spirit in us, which is the down payment for what's to come. And so this, the, these are ideas that you can pull from Revelation and preach tremendous messages mm-hmm. off of them. Each one of those could be a message. Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, There's a three-part series right Yeah, there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, you know. Um, People say we've never done a series on Revelation. There's well, one right there. Yeah, that's, that's one right there. So um, I, I guess the last thing is the biggest question is 666. Everybody wants to know what so. Do you want me to give them yeah, the answer great, for that? Absolutely. <laughs> See, you are you are giving them the key. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it's you know people are probably going to dislike hearing this um, from me all the time, but um, it's all symbolism, right? You know, the number seven is very important in Revelation. It's the number of completion, and um, the number 10, 10, You know, multiples of ten. Twelve people of God. Well, six is the number of man. And there's three of them, right? 666. And you have that at the end of chapter 13 when the unholy trinity has been introduced of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And so it's it's the, the in Revelation, there's this dichotomy between the people of the earth and the people of God. The people of God are marked with the seal, or they're, they're not marked, they're sealed with the seal of God. And we learn in Revelation 14 that the seal is the name of the Father and of the son who's put on their forehead. So they, they're marked to, that belong to him. And then the people of the earth are, are marked by the beast, with the mark of the beast, which is the number of man. So they have um, given themselves over to the things of the earth, the things of this life, as opposed to the things of God. And, and you know, in walking with God, here's another message, in walking with God, God calls us to complete obedience and sacrifice. I mean, Jesus did it in Luke chapter 14. He turned around to the crowd and he said, Luke purposely says, there's a large crowd following me. He turns around and he says, if any of you want to follow me, you got to hate your mother, your father, Mm -hmm. your wife, your daughter, your son, you know, and you can't, or you can't be my disciple. That's pretty shocking. But this is what God, God calls us to no reservations, right? To, to complete dedication to him, to follow him completely, to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so this is, you know, this is kind of the undertone in Revelation. You have the, the people who, are, who belong to God and the people who belong to the world. And we see that everywhere today, right? We still see that. That's another application mm-hmm. of Revelation is you see people who have made choices that are going to lead them down certain paths. And Revelation tells us what the end of those choices is, a little like a fire or the New Jerusalem. Well, this has been so helpful. And I I have so many more questions, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna save them for round two because oh, I need okay. to have you I need to have you back because I, I'm sure there's people that are listening that honestly, I mean, even being in the class to now, I'm just excited for people to who, who asked this, they, I mean, they asked for this. They are the ones who said, I want this topic. But I yeah, think it's, yeah. I think it's because it's, it can be difficult, but what you've done today is you've helped people, you've helped make it less difficult. And I think you've intrigued people. And it doesn't mean there isn't difficulty in the passages. Obviously you have a lot right. of experience in it, but my hope is that, that people would hear this and be encouraged and say, I could preach on this, or I can talk about this. And yeah. also mm-hmm. that they'd, they'd learn more. They, they'd want to, digest this more and maybe rather than that being a book they quick 
read through at the end of the year and then move on to the mm-hmm. next, mm-hmm. that they'd say, hey, hey, how can I take this seriously and help my congregation understand it or help my small group understand it? So mm-hmm. it's been incredibly helpful and blessings to you on your travels as you go all across the world this year, many different continents, countries. If you end up going to Vietnam and preaching there, I'm excited to hear about how you yeah. preach on Revelation yeah. to them. Yeah. Um, but we're just excited for you and for those, if they're interested in learning more about what you're doing or want to invite you or what, what would be the best way to for them to get connected with you? Uh, well, yeah, probably our website, uh, which is probably harder to say than to spell. <laughs> we'll put it in the description. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, viollumierefr.com, which is um, French for City of Light. Um, our original call to missions was in Paris, and uh, we sell real hard for Paris. So our ministry is uh, Vieux Lumiere Paris Ministries. Amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll link that in the description in the show notes so that people can find you and get to know more of you if they'd like to. And mm-hmm. until next time, we'll have you back soon when you get back from all your travels to have part two. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to Talking Church on YouTube. I hope this episode was helpful for you. You can find all a bunch of different episodes right here that are linked that maybe you've not caught up yet, or maybe this is new to you, Finding Talking Church. Would you consider subscribing to the YouTube channel? It helps us out a lot. Get this message out there to more people and hopefully helps you out as well. And feel free, write a comment, ask us a question. We want to hear from you. Thanks so much for being a listener to Talking Church. We'll see you back soon.